the edge of the Mojave Desert lies a lake so massive it made cities like Las Vegas and Phoenix possible. But today, it's disappearing faster than anyone ever imagined. This is Lake Mead, once the largest man-made reservoir in the United States, a lake that drowned canyons, turned desert into farmland, and brought entire cities to life across the Southwest. But now, it tells a very different story. See those white lines along the canyon walls? They're not just water stains. They're called bathtub rings, a stark reminder of how far the water has fallen. Back in 1983, Lake Mead reached its highest level of 1,225 feet above sea level, and since then, it's dropped more than 170 feet, the same height as a 17-story building, just gone. And if the water level falls below 895 feet, it hits what's called a dead pool. That's the point where water can't flow through Hoover Dam anymore. So what exactly went wrong? How did a symbol of American ambition become the face of a growing crisis? Why are the water levels still dropping? And is there any chance this lake can be saved? This is the story of Lake Mead. The 1930s, a turbulent chapter in American history. The country was deep in the grip of the Great Depression. Millions were out of work. Farms were failing. Resources were scarce and frustration across the nation was at an all-time high. But deep in the desert, the U.S. government launched a project so massive, so ambitious, that it would reshape the future of the American West. On a remote stretch of the Colorado River, where the borders of Nevada and Arizona meet, they broke ground on one of the greatest engineering feats in U.S. history, the Hoover Dam. A wall of concrete towering 726 feet, wedged into Black Canyon to do what no one had done before, stop the mighty Colorado River. And it worked. Once the dam was built, the river began to back up, flooding the canyon behind it and creating a brand new lake, Lake Mead. Fed by the Colorado River flowing down from the Grand Canyon, the lake slowly filled the desert, stretching deep into the side canyons, eventually growing more than 100 miles long. At full capacity, Lake Mead could hold 26 million acre feet of water, enough to supply over 50 million homes for a year. But this wasn't just a lake, it was a promise. A promise that water would always be there, that cities would grow in the desert, that farmland could bloom, and that electricity would power homes across the West. This was America in full ambition mode, taming rivers, reshaping landscapes, and building a future around a lake that was never supposed to exist. For decades, Lake Mead delivered on every promise. The lake brimmed with water, the turbines hummed with power, and the cities it fed grew faster than anyone imagined. By the 1980s, the reservoir hit its peak. Every canyon was flooded, every marina was full. Las Vegas was booming, Phoenix was exploding and the lights of the Southwest blazed bright, powered by the quiet force of Hoover Dam. Lake Mead had become more than just a reservoir. It became a playground. Families floated across its surface in houseboats. Jet skis left trails across the waves. Fishermen lined the shore, and tourists stood on the dam, staring down at the lake that wasn't supposed to exist. At its height, Lake Mead supplied water to over 25 million people, nearly 1 in 12 Americans. But with all that comfort came a dangerous illusion, that the lake would always be full, that the river would always flow, that nature could be bent to human will forever. But the truth is, the cracks were there all along. From the very beginning, the system had a quiet flaw. Back in 1922, when state leaders gathered to divide up the Colorado River, they signed what became known as the Colorado River Compact. But this was during an unusually wet period. They believed the river would always deliver a certain amount of water, about 17 million acre feet a year. But in reality, it never could. And yet, the promises kept stacking. Cities got their share, farms got theirs. Even places hundreds of miles away, like Southern California, were given rights to the water. On paper, the numbers added up. 
but in real life, the river just couldn't keep up. Old water laws made it worse, especially one called use it or lose it. That meant if a farmer didn't use every drop of their allocation, they risked losing it the next year. So fields were often flooded, not because they needed the water, but because the system demanded it. Meanwhile, cities in the Southwest were exploding. Between 1990 and 2020, Las Vegas nearly tripled in size. Phoenix doubled, and the demand kept growing. But the river, it was shrinking, and so was Lake Mead. At first, it was slow, a few feet lost here and there. But over time, the drop became impossible to ignore. Then came the famous drought. Starting in the early 2000s, the American Southwest slipped into what scientists would later call a mega drought, the worst in over 1,200 years. The Rocky Mountains, where the Colorado River starts, began receiving less snow. And when snow did fall, warmer temperatures melted it too fast or evaporated it before it could reach the river. Lake Mead, once towering at 1,229 feet above sea level in 1983, started to fall. Slowly at first, then sharply. By 2025, it hovers at around 1,050 feet, a level so low some of the dam's turbines can barely spin. If it falls below 950 feet, the dam stops generating power altogether. The visual transformation was impossible to ignore. Near Echo Bay, where water once lapped at concrete piers, the docks now hang in the air, stranded. Houseboats sit tilted in the dirt, and a thick white scar has formed along the canyon walls, what locals call the bathtub rink. It's not just a color change, it's a warning, a ghost of where the water once stood. But the fall of Lake Mead is also tearing apart an entire ecosystem. As the shoreline retreats, wetlands that once supported birds, fish, and amphibians are drying up. Native fish are disappearing, and migratory birds have stopped returning. Invasive species like quagga mussels have taken over, clogging pipes and outcompeting native life. In the exposed lake bed, it's become a new threat, kicking up dust laced with heavy metals and toxins. Cities downwind are now breathing that in. But in the face of this crisis, a massive rescue effort has already begun. Federal, state, and tribal governments have joined forces under the 500 Plus Plan, a landmark agreement to keep at least 500,000 acre feet of water in Lake Mead each year. It's one of the most ambitious conservation moves the Colorado River Basin has ever seen, including millions of dollars and urgent water saving strategies. Farmers across Arizona and California have started leaving their land dry to reduce water use. Others are shifting to less thirsty crops or using precision drip irrigation systems that deliver water directly to plant roots drop by drop. In Las Vegas, nearly all indoor water is now recycled. Tribal nations who have managed these lands for thousands of years are stepping forward with ancestral stewardship models. Their leadership is shaping new agreements and offering long overdue representation in river management. Meanwhile, the National Park Service is working along the shrinking shoreline, planting native species, stabilizing eroded banks, and rebuilding fragments of lost wetlands. These may be small moves, but slowly, the change is starting to show. After years of steady decline, water levels have inched up, not by much, but enough to matter. In 2024, after conservation cuts took effect and a slightly wetter winter arrived, Lake Mead rose by a few feet. Young people are joining AmeriCorps and local water corps, restoring habitats, removing invasive species, and teaching the next generation what it means to live with a fragile resource. They're not working on a fix that comes next week or next year. They're building towards something slower, more lasting. As one official put it, it's slow, but it's possible. Lake Mead was never supposed to be here, but it became a symbol of what humans can build, and now it's a test for what humans can salvage. What happens next won't just be a test of policy or engineering. It'll be a test of our ability to cooperate with nature, to act with humility, and to remember the scale of what we once built. The path forward won't be easy, and it won't be quick. But maybe, if done rightly, Lake Mead doesn't have to be a monument to failure. It can become a story of revival.